for your goodness, Lord God. We praise you. We worship you and exalt you this morning, Lord God. We magnify you, Lord God. Lord, and we thank you for your presence in this place and your goodness that's here, Lord God. Lord, we just magnify you in your presence this morning, Lord God. Lord, and we thank you, Lord God, and we praise you, Father God, for what you have in store for us, even now and even for those that are watching, Lord God. Lord, and again, we just thank you and we just praise you. And the whole church says, Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Do you know everyone has their communion cup ready? You may be seated. You know, God is so good in so many ways, even when we don't think, when we're struggling, God is there. You know, and that was the whole purpose of him dying on the cross, is to give you guys a new sense of hope, peace, health, and prosperity. No matter what we're going through physically, what he did on the cross in this little element can heal you if you have that faith, like the size of a mustard seed. He says, you know, he loved us so much. You know, my wife shared something, and it really hit me yesterday. But he had everything. Just like these rich people have everything, they don't feel that they need God because they got their money and possessions. And here, Jesus had everything in heaven. But yet he is still willing to leave it all behind and come to you and I. And that's why we celebrate communion Sunday. To remember what he did for us. What he went through for you and I. You know, and I know we're not going to do the wall this morning for time's sake. But there's people that need prayer here. And remember these people. Remember even when you partake in this, put them in your heart. Brother Mike needs our prayer. He's still hurting and struggling. You know, um, pray for Brother Jesse and the Hernandez family. They're, they're going to go and celebrate his sister's life into eternity. She's not gone. She's alive and well because of him that lives in her. But put peace because there is that void. There's other people that need a physical touch, you know. And through this, there's miracle power. You know, there, there was some sisters that came on Wednesday to share what's going on with their niece that's dealing physically with, with cancer. You know, you hear the C word, you panic. But here we've been praying and praying for this young lady, and we were told her numbers are going down. The spots that they thought they saw aren't there no more. That's the power of prayer, and that's what this element represents. This is what he did for us and why it's broken. It's for all of us. So, again, when we take of this, remember his goodness, no matter what you're going through right now, no matter what pain, what brokenness you're in, this will take it all away if you remember that. So with that, we're just going to pray for this element. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for what this little piece of bread represents, Lord, your body, Lord, that was given for us, Lord God, in all our iniquities, Lord, in all our brokenness, Lord God. And I thank you as we partake in it, Lord God, Lord, that it would restore even us, Lord, in our human bodies, Lord, in the areas that we need, Lord, and even for our loved ones, Lord, as we stand in a proxy for them, Lord. Lord, and again, we just thank you for what you did and for the love that you have for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take it all. Even when he shared with the disciples, when he was giving the bread and, and the wine, you know, as we take this, we rep it represents his blood. And, you know, it's amazing that how we don't hear a lot of churches talk about the blood. But there's so much power in that blood. Amen. It's amazing what that blood can do. We need to learn about the blood. Study the blood for yourselves, and you'll understand his, the power of the blood that he shed on that cross for us. Because he didn't stay on that cross, as you know. He, ro he, he rose three days. You know? And it's just amazing when we really realize what this blood represents, what this cup represents, and what it can do in your life. So with that, we're going to just take of this. Amen? And Lord, and we thank you that we had this opportunity, Lord to share, Lord, in communion and in remembrance of you and what you did for all of us, Lord God. Lord, I thank you that it would continue to touch our brothers and sisters, even those that aren't here, Lord, with us, Lord. Lord, and I thank you, Lord, that you would 
bring it all back to remembrance, Lord God, even when we in our battles, Lord, what you did over 2,000 years ago upon that cross for us, Lord. And again, we just thank you and we just praise you. And the whole church says, amen. Amen. Turn around, get up, shake someone's hand, welcome them. Good morning, everybody. All right, we'll get back to our seat now. So we know that Pastor and Barbara are out of town. They're up in the, the mountains having a good time, getting some rest and relaxation. Um, they're live streaming us right now. Hello. And uh, I'm going to do announcements. I know it's a little different. It's a little out of the box. But I kind of felt this week that, actually for a few weeks, that God had put something upon my heart to share with you guys. And this is the time that it has to be because in two days something very important is going to happen. So we'll go through the announcements real quick. Uh, don't forget Monday, Monday night, 7 p.m., Women's Devotional. Uh, if you haven't participated in it, get a hold of Laura or anybody else. It's virtual. It's uh, through Zoom. So if you need any help connecting with that, please feel free to contact somebody in leadership to be able to get you connected. Um, we also have prayer, prayer on Wednesday nights. Uh, that's here up in the sanctuary. Make sure you're here for uh, Wednesday night prayer at 7 p.m. Um, I'm going to keep the announcements kind of short. 7 p.m. Thursday in the evening. Men, we meet downstairs. Uh, we have a Bible study. We're going verse by verse through the Bible. Right now we're in the book of John. We're just finishing up. We have another chapter and a half, and we're about done. Then we were going to move on to Matthew. If you want to come, if you haven't done it before, we're just going through the Bible. Real simple, reading through it, seeing what's there, seeing what God wants to put upon our hearts. Um, so, that being said, what I have to talk about today is what's coming up on Tuesday. You know, a lot of people, we look at this and we say, oh, you know, it's the second Tuesday of November, we're going to go vote. It's, you know, our usual thing, our routine. Uh, now with the advent of mail-in ballots, some of us don't even think about it. It just gets dropped in your mailbox. You get it. You want to fill it out like a Scantron, and you send it in. And, and sometimes the thought process behind that just is, you know, it's kind of quick. It's like, okay, we got, we got it done. We got it checked off of our list. It's our yearly thing. And, you know, I was kind of pushed back to looking at the time of the kings. You know, at the very first king, Saul, in 1 Samuel... Um, chapter 8, <clears throat> we get to hear the story about that when Israel is just begging for a king. They want to have a ruler over them. Imagine that. They want to give up their sovereignty. They have a God who's so powerful and so mighty and has guided them and directed them, got them out of Egypt, but yet they want to put a man above them to be in charge of them. And they asked for that. And they went up to Samuel and they asked him, they said, you know what, we want a king just like all the rest of the nations. And then the next thing they did, Samuel, man, he's like, oh, man, he was just so frustrated, so bothered by it. He goes to God. Samuel goes to God. He says, God, they want a king. What do I do? So God says in verse 6, or 
verse 6, we're going into this little scripture real fast. It displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, he answered, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me, God that I should not reign over them. And then God says, you know what? Let them see what this king is going to be like. Let them see what this is going to be like to be controlled. We have a nation that was started by our forefathers. And in this nation that was created, they went out and they wanted freedom from tyranny, from a government that was taking control of them, taking charge of them, not allowing them to worship freely, taxing them beyond control, spending the money that was taxed on for things that the government wanted and not for the nation here in the United States. So then we had these forefathers with, I believe, the guidance of God. Think about this. You know, we look at them and we look at history and we think that there's a bunch of old guys that went and fought for this nation in the revolution and they started up this new country. No, they were young guys. They were young guys who were fighting. They were farmers. They were businessmen. They were all kinds of normal people, every av average, everyday kind of people. And they were out there fighting for a freedom against this tyranny that they felt. And why were they doing that? Because they wanted to have that freedom. They were in this new nation. As they fought, and then they went through, and I believe they were God-directed when they created our Constitution. Because think of it, these young men, where are they going to come up? No political background, no nothing. And they come up with a structure for a government that never existed before. It had to be God-inspired. Why do I say that? Well, what was one of the first things they did? The first thing they did was recognize that all of our rights and freedoms are given by God. And that they cannot be infringed upon. They saw this. They realized this. They realized that that was the most important thing, and they put God first in their constitution. They put God first in their constitutional republic. Many of us don't know that. We hear democracy, democracy. It's a constitutional republic. Why is that? Because these people created a government that was ran by the people. They didn't want to put a ruler above them because they knew the dangers of the power of a ruler. So it was the people that were to vote and go and serve a little time and to help maintain things in this government. That's what our forefathers strived for. But over time, it became just like the Israelites did. And sooner or later, the government became more and more powerful and took more control. Why? Because this is the reason why I wanted to get up here and talk. Because a lot of us don't want to take the time, effort, and energy that it takes to look and see what is taking care of us. What is it that is up there? You know, those forefathers, they put all their effort and energy into picking these people. They put all their effort and energy to make sure that they were good people. You know, it was like, like when you're looking for a pastor. You know, we're given qualifications in the Bible. And these people were looking for those qualifications in order to find this government leadership that was going to be over them. And it wasn't so much over them, but it was just to keep control of things and just to keep things in order, decent and in order. So I'm up here to say and to ask you guys, take the time, effort, and energy. The next scripture that I have is the one that really started this all. And it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 talks about end times. It talks about the return of the Lord. It talks about these times and seasons that we're not going to know exactly when it's going to happen. But we're going to have a feeling. We're going to have just a little spidey sense to know kind of when this is coming. And Paul is sitting here talking to the church in Thessalonica. Thessalonica, I probably just obliterated that pronunciation. But so he's talking to this church and he's telling them, you know, it's going to be rough. There's going to be darkness. There's going to be evil. There's going to be all kinds of things. And then he comes into the end of it and he gives these various exhortations, corrections, 
Just things, don't grow weary. Be strong, don't get faint-hearted. See that no one renders evil for evil. He goes through all these things and coming down to the tail end, he gets to the verse that just kept sticking in my head and that's verse 21. Test all things, hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. We've all heard that, right? Now, that verse just seems very simple and very contrite, very small. I went to the Amplified. But test and prove all things until you can recognize what is good. To that, hold fast. Abstain from evil, shrink from it, and keep away from it in whatever form or whatever kind it may be. We take time as people, if we want to get a phone, a new cell phone, an iPad, a computer, a car, we buy a house, we want to go, you know, pick out a, a nail salon or a hair salon, you know, all these things, we take time to sit there and look into it and find out, you know, what, is this a good place to go to? We investigate it. We find out, hey, you know what? Do I really want to go get my hair there? What are the reviews of this place, you know? Are, are, are they going to butcher me? You know, or, or do I want to get this phone? Does it have a lot of problems? Is this computer not going to work for me very well? This house, do I want to live in that neighborhood? We will spend hours and hours and hours to look into these things, to find out if it's the best fit for us. The most important thing is that we keep God at the center of our lives for all decisions. As we keep him in the center of our lives for all decisions, then we will take into consideration, we will ask him, we will seek him. Why don't we do this for the people that we put in office? Why is it that we will look to a color? We will look to a party. We will look to a thing. And we won't bother even taking into consideration what their, what their morals are, what their values are. We don't take the time to find that out. We've got Alexa, we've got Siri, we've got Google. We've got all these different things that we can look up information, and we'll look up information for all those other things that we're doing in our lives. But the things that are most important, the people that are ruling over us, are we turning away from wanting to have God rule over us and godly people, or are we just stepping aside and, and making the easy choice? We need to keep God as the focus. We need to test all those things. As we look at these people, take the time. Look up who the person is. Look what they voted for. Are they voting for evil things? You know, we've got, we could start from the beginning where we've got the local city governments. We've got the school governments. And do we bother to even take the time to look and think, who are these people that are going to be teaching our children? What are they going to want to teach our children? Do we take the time to look into these people's lives at all? A simple search on the internet. All these people are Facebook, Instagram, whatever. They've got all these different things. You can see real quick and kind of get an idea of what this person is like. We're not going to take someone else's word for it because the news or whatever it may be has their own opinion. We need to test it against the word of God. Are these people of good? intentions or of evil intentions. We have these governments, starting from the schools, going up level by level by level, state, federal. We have state governments that didn't allow us to meet for church. How ridiculous is that? Walmart, strip clubs, Home Depot, all these things were allowed to remain open but we were not allowed to come together in fellowship. We were forsaking the gathering of fellowship because a government didn't want to allow us to do it. Was it constitutional? No. Our own governor lost in court. Did he have to pay a punishment or a price for what his choice was to lock down churches? No. Tax money from our pockets gets paid out to these churches that fought for our rights. Thank you for these churches that fought for our rights so that we could get together and gather. They fought in court against our governor. He doesn't get punished. He pays money out of the state wallet, and he walks away scot-free for making a bad choice that's unconstitutional. Our only way to hold these 
government officials accountable is at this ballot box. We need to show the importance that is there. We need to take the time out of our day, go down, vote. You know, we do have the mail-in ballots. We could do it by mail. That's the easy way if you want. But why not just go in just to make sure? Fill it out on paper, you know, because when you go in, at least there you know that they come in, they check off your name, and they say, okay, here you go, you haven't voted yet. You know for sure that it's your ballot and that nothing can happen. But sometimes it's too inconvenient. It, 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 we just don't have the time. Look, we have, a, we have a forecast of rain, so somebody might not want to go out in the rain. But this is far too important. We are electing officials that are going to oversee us. They are making choices whether or not babies get to live in the womb. They are making choices whether children are being whether children are being just, oh, it's so hard. You know what I'm talking about. I don't want to go there. Children are being sexualized, and that is wrong. If we did what is happening governmentally in schools, talking about those things, if we did that in a business world, we would be taken into HR right away, and we will be in trouble for sexual harassment. But yet our teachers are allowed to do these things. They're forced to do it. They don't have a choice. They have to follow the rules. And these are the people that you are putting in office by not looking into these people, by not taking the time or the energy. Isn't it worth it? Aren't your children worth it? Aren't your grandchildren worth it? We put judges into court. Judges who will punish the people who are being criminalized, who are being taken advantage of, who are being robbed and stolen from. They get punished. The criminals walk scot-free, especially in our state. Our state is so freely letting out criminals. They are not held accountable. We are called to be held accountable for our actions. But what happens when they aren't held accountable? Then it becomes a free-for-all, and that's what we see. I don't know how many times I've been in stores and I've watched people run out with product. And I'm like, do something. I'm like, you guys come run. I'll run with you. But you guys are the business. I'll get in trouble. Why can't we hold people accountable? You know, we think, oh, it's just a judge. Who is that guy? I don't know. What's his name? Oh, that guy sounds good. The name, whatever it is. We don't even know about these judges. We don't know what they're going to do. We don't know if they're going to set these criminals free. We don't know if they're going to send people to rehab for drug problems. We have a homeless situation here in California that is growing exponentially out of control. I just had to deal with it Friday. I had a homeless guy in a rental property of my mom's. He started a fire in the house. He was trying to cook. Don't get me wrong. I feel bad for the guy. That, there, that he's there, that's the only way he's trying to survive. But it's a danger to the property. It's a danger to his own health. He crawled in through a hole in the roof, boarded up completely, started a fire. If a fire starts and gets going, how's he getting out? He's going to get hurt. But it's mental illness. It's drug use. It's all those things that were taken away from treatment in our, in our state, especially. I have friends who worked in the mental facilities, and they lost their jobs because all those jobs went away, whether it be Patton, whether it be the other one here that was in Pomona, I forgot the name already, but it was another mental facility where they were treated for their drug abuse, they were treated for their mental illness, and then they were able to seek help, but instead we pay and we pay and we pay, and they're allowed to continue that lifestyle with no repercussion. The Bible says, you don't work, you don't eat but we don't want to hold people to that. Yes, we could help. That's what churches are for. When our nation started, we had churches, we had hospitals, all these things, the universities, they were all Christian-based. That's how this nation started. It was by donations of the church. It was by donations of the people with their time and energy and effort. Loma Linda, one of the most 
sought after hospital schools here. That's a Seventh-day Adventist. They started out as a Christian university, went into the medical field. We have all these things, all these tools at our hands that sometimes we just don't want to put the effort in. I'm not here to beat us down. I'm here to encourage you. It's not that hard. Find this information out. Take the time. You would do it for any other thing in your life. Take the time to look into these people. Take the time to make these hard choices and to put people. Now, don't get me wrong. There are lots of things that we're going to see in the news that are about, oh, this is so bad and this is so good. But we're not comparing things to a worldly standard. We have a biblical standard that we are comparing these things to. Evil is evil. Good is good. Light and dark. They cannot coexist. Don't get confused by the side things. Yes, am I concerned about the environment? Yes. But do I know that eventually this world is going to deteriorate and be gone? Yes. I know the end of the Bible says that. It's going to be destroyed. We're going to lose water. We're going to lose fields. We're going to lose grass. We're going to lose all kinds of things. Don't let those other side things be a distraction from the main point. It's evil to mess with kids. It's evil to mess with babies. It's evil to let criminals get away with harming good people. It's evil to leave homeless on their own resources who have mental illness and drug illness to fend for themselves without the true help that they need. Don't just keep giving them a sandwich or whatever it may be and, and set it aside, out of the way, out of sight, out of mind. They fill up washes. They fill up trees along the freeway. They have all these encampments around, but yet they're getting no true help for the problem that really is at the root of the cause, their mental illness and their, their drug addictions. Yes, are there families that are homeless? Yes, that had a, a tough time with a job or something like that. Those are the ones that usually will go to a shelter right away, get the help that they need, and get going on with their life. They'll live out of their car for a little while, but they will move on. They'll come to a church. A church will definitely help them and look after that needs. But we as people need to take the time, and, and, and we, have, we have the capability. We may not think that, oh, it's so difficult to try to find this stuff. It's not difficult in our day and age. If you're unsure about it, ask someone that you know that might be able to help you. Someone who has a biblical understanding. Don't look to people of the world. Don't look for information of the world. Bounce everything off of your Bible. Test all things, whether they are of good or of evil. If they are good, go that way. If they are evil, stay away. Don't even give them a chance to be into office. Our kids are too valuable. They're the ones that are going to come into our country and continue this legacy. And if we don't set them up with the proper training, then we're in trouble. You know, you, you may spend how much money at Starbucks for coffees or, or go to, to get the fancy clothes or whatever you may do, but yet you don't want to sacrifice to put your kids in a private education. I would pull them out of this mess. I, I, I don't want, I, I have friends who have kids who have struggled with wanting to kill themselves because of gender confusion. It was a mental illness 10 years ago, and now it's not anymore. It doesn't just change like that. Our doctor's hands are being tied, in the state of California especially, their hands are being tied as to what they can do and what they can say. Fight for your families, fight for your kids, fight for your nation, get out there and vote and know who you're voting for. With that being said, I'm sorry to go on for you guys and take up Bessie's time, but I think she's still good, I hope. So with Pastor being out of town, 
we have a guest speaker today, and she's going to get up here and give us an encouragement through the Word of God and help us just to, to just build up a little more hope through our days. And whatever it is that she has as a message, I don't even know what it is. But we're going to bring her up here, my sister-in-law, Bessie. As Bam has introduced me, I don't know how many times, now I get to introduce her. So let's have Bessie come up here and give us a word. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Thank you. As I've mentioned before, this is my favorite season of the year. I love the changing of the colors of the leaves. I love the coolness and the heat during the day. You know, you can only get that in California because we were back east when, when uh, Thanksgiving uh, season and it was just cold, just straight cold at back there. Um, yeah, so it's just beautiful. It's my favorite time. It's also my favorite time because of Thanksgiving because I really like to thank the Lord, kind of like the songs that we sang today. I really like to thank the Lord for everything, Lord, that he, that he does for us, that he continues to do for us, and from the things, Lord, that he protects us from, a lot of things that we don't even know about. I truly, truly am thankful to the Lord for, for his actions and for his covering of us, his protection of us. You know, in school, we're all taught to... Um, that Thanksgiving is the time when people came to our country to establish our country for religious freedom. And um, I'm thankful for that too, or else our, government, our country would not be the way it is. Granted, our, cover, our government goes through bumps in the road, like we're, we have a big bump we're going through right now. But we'll get through this if we focus on the Lord. Okay. Um, and as we do this, um, I know that during this time of the year, there's a lot of people that feel from their heart and or are encouraged by others to give to charities, which is a good thing. Um, and many people don't understand why they do that. They just do because others do, and that's okay. But whether you know it or not, that's something that God has put us on earth for. He's, he's put us on earth to help each other out whether it's through giving through charity or going to a neighbor and helping them out, that's what God has put us here for, to work together, to help us get through these, our lives together as a family. When we help the less fortunate and when we do it from our heart, it's counted as righteousness for us. And it will stand through the fire at the end of our lives when it comes to judgment. It will stand strong. And I'd like everybody to turn to our first scripture, which is Proverbs 19.17. And I'm going to read out of uh, the New King James Version. And it states, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you, Lord, and I praise you, Father God, Lord, for the word that you've instilled in me, Lord. I thank you, Lord, and I praise you, Father God, Lord, that we all have ears to hear and hearts to receive, Lord, which you have prepared for us today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me share with you what this means. Pity. Pity is a feeling of sorrow and compassion that's caused by suffering and the misunderstanding of others. Pity. Compassion. Let me give you an example of pity and compassion from the Old Testament. I'm going to take us back to a man by the name of Obadiah. During the time of, Eli of the prophet Elijah, King Ahab, and Queen Jezebel. King Ahab was the king of Israel at that time, 
and he took for himself a wife from King Sidon. And her name was Jezebel. He made her queen. And Queen Jezebel did not believe in the Lord. She did not follow the Lord's ways. She, in fact, persuaded King Ahab to promote the worship of deities and false gods. She also harassed and killed the king's prophets. Obadiah was in charge of King Ahab's house. So he lived in the palace. He took care of everything that the king and queen needed. So I'm going to ask you guys to turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. And I'm going to read there. Let me know when you're there. And it says, And Ahab called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them 50 to a cave and had fed them with bread and water. I'm going to stop there. So Obadiah, in the King James Version, uh, he's called the governor. And so he, that meant that he was paid very well. And he had power because he was supposed to take care of the king and queen of the land. And those are great attributes that were given to him and great responsibilities that were given to him. The scripture here does share with us a little bit about Obadiah. It says that Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. That means that he knew, he looked, he searched out what God's heart was for him and for the land. Okay? He wasn't a prophet, remember. He was the palace administrator. But although he lived with the ungodly, because Ahab and Jezebel did not stand up for what the Lord wanted, he did. He looked. He searched. Okay? And he took those hundred prophets and he hid them. And he hid them in two caves. Why in two caves? His thought is, if they found one cave and they killed 50, he still had 50 prophets left. Why did he want to save the prophets? Because he knew that at some point in time, at one point in time, right now the land is going through a severe drought. They're on year three of a severe drought. After this drought was over, and once they got people to help him, he knew that he would need the prophets to teach the people of the land of the Lord and what the Lord wanted, and that he was their God, and that, he was, and that they were his people. Because right now they didn't know. They didn't care, because they were being oppressed by ungodliness. When Obadiah hid the hundred prophets, he not only protected them and he fed them, because Jezebel had cut off all provisions for the prophets, specifically. If you were a prophet, no water, no food, no bare essentials were available for you. So somebody had to get it for them. This is where Obadiah's position came into place. He was able to get food. He didn't have to tell the people where he got the food from who he was getting them for. He didn't have to. They all knew that he worked for the king and queen. So most people probably just assumed, oh, he's getting the food for the king and queen. So he got the food, which he paid out of, from, from his own pocket, from his own checkbook, and he gave the bread and water to the prophets to survive off of. Now, Obadiah was not a Jew, so I want to make sure that, I want to make clear that you understand that he learned of God. He was not a Jew. He was not brought up as a Jew. He didn't know 
their culture to the point that a Jewish person would. He just heard the stories of how God released the Israelites from bondage when they were in Egypt. He heard of stories of how God provided for the Israelites when they were wandering in the desert, how their shoes didn't wear out, how their clothing didn't wear out, how God fed them with quail and manna and provided water from a rock. So he knows the power of God. He knew very well the power of God, and he himself believed and would follow God's leading and guidance. Obadiah's act of kindness that he showed to the hundred prophets showed his strong relationship that he had with God. No other man would do that. No other man would burden, burden himself with a hundred prophets. But Obadiah remembered what the scripture said back in Proverbs. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. Let's reflect on that a bit. If you were Obadiah, would you take on the responsibility of feeding 100 prophets and hiding them in a cave? I'm sure Obadiah didn't feed them three times a day, but I could be wrong. Even if he fed them one time a day, for one day, that's a lot of money just for bread and water. And I don't know how, long, how much longer the, the drought was going to go on. Was it another year? At that point in time, he had no way of knowing. God didn't reveal that to him. But he did it. He did it, and he remained faithful because he knew that that's what the Lord wanted, and he knew that those prophets would be useful. And he knew that there's a reason why Jezebel wanted to kill them. There was more in them for them to give to the people of Israel. Now, if you were Obadiah's spouse, what would be going through your head? You know how much your family uses on a monthly basis, but yet you're seeing things just go to the prophets. But what about you and your family? How are you going to hold up? You're seeing your checkbook balance go down. You're seeing your savings balance go down. And whatever you hide in, in a shoe or under the mattress, your spouse is asking you, hey, do you have any extra money? Because I need to feed them today. And of course, you know, the two of you are one, I would hope. And you're going to give the money and you're going to say, here, I'm believing in you. This is going to come to an end. You don't know when, but it's going to come to an end. And Obadiah was there. And I'm sure he had the same thoughts come through his mind. But he pushed those thoughts away, and he kept on supporting the hundred prophets. So I'm going to ha ask you to turn now to Romans 3. And I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. And it says, what advantage then has the Jew? What is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them, meaning the Jew, were com committed the oracles of God. That means that the word of God was made very plain to the Jews. That means that the Jews knew exactly what God meant. You see, the Bible's been translated into English, and in its translation, we lose a lot. The Bible was written for the Jewish culture. We're an American culture. There's a lot lost in translation. The Jews understood very well what God was meaning. We don't. We have to search out. 
we have to figure out what's happening. We come, sometimes we come to our own conclusions, and they're wrong, because later on we find out, oh, that's what that meant, because somebody of Jewish descent shares with us what it really means, what that word really means. And I say that because there's this Roman Jewish historian called Josephus who shares with us that Obadiah's wealth was depleted by feeding the prophets. So if you thought that he was going to go poor and broke, you're right. His actions do show and would show that if there's no stop of him giving, that you are going to go broke. But he was doing God's will. Okay? Remember that. He was doing God's will. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. And I also want to let you know that this historian, Josephus, also shares with us that the widow that's described in this section of the Bible is the wife of Obadiah. And at this time, Obadiah has died, and his widow wife and his two sons are struggling to support themselves as the creditors are now after them. The creditors will now take the two boys as slaves as their tangible commercial value and would produce an inflow of money that the creditors would now subtract from the widow woman's debt. Now the custom of that time was after six years of being slaves, the two boys would be released and the debt would be canceled. Now, that would be crossing your fingers and making sure that their land would not be conquered by any other king that would just abolish that whole thing and the two boys could be slaves forever. Okay? So that's the widow woman's heart. She's scared for her boys. Okay? So let's read. In 2 Kings, I'm going to read um, 1 through 4. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elijah said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has... Nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. When you, ha- when you have them, come in, and you shall shut the door behind you, and you and your sons. Then pour it into those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, And she poured it out. Now it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her, to her sons, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There aren't any more. So the oil ceased, and she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons will live on the rest. From the scripture you perceive that the husband had not planned efficiently for his family's financial future after his passing. But I remind you what the scripture says back in Proverbs. It says, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. Look back on verse 1. The widow woman says, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. 
She knew. Did she need to remind Elisha of this? I don't think so. She said it because she needed to hear that. She needed to hear that her husband's no longer, but that her husband feared the Lord and that he stood on what the Lord had told him to do. Okay. Because she, she, he stood on what the Lord said and she backed him, Elijah has now given her the opportunity, given her a means by which to pay the debt that she had. And not only that, she had enough to pay the debt and to live on the rest. I don't know how much longer her life was. But God used Elisha to, tol- to tell her that she didn't have to worry anymore. God would take care of her the rest of her life. All she had to do was collect the vessels, fill the vessels with oil, and sell them. She had to do her part, and God would take care of the rest. Okay? And that's true for all of us. We just need to do our part. We need to hear what the Lord is telling us to do. We need to take those actions and fulfill the actions that the Lord has asked us to do and he will take care of the rest. There are other stories in the Bible where the individual didn't know what the outcome would be, and it didn't look really good, but the Lord took care of them. One of them was Joseph showing pity towards his brothers when there again was a famine and his brothers were coming to him not not knowing that it was his brother. But God took care of both Joseph and the brothers. The story of the Good Samaritan, there's another story where a young man was beat up and left on the side of the road. There was a a man that came by, bandaged his wounds, took him to an inn, told the innkeeper, here's some money, take care of him, I'll be back in a few days. All that happened, and the Lord took care of it. But I warn you, don't be like the man in Matthew 19 that refused to follow the Lord because he was told, you need to sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, then follow me. That man couldn't handle it. His countenance fell. And he walked away very sadly because he knew he couldn't depart from the riches of this world. And yet, there's one last person that I do want to bring to your attention, but I want you to turn to Philippians 4. uh, Chapter 4, I'll read at verse 7. But before I read there, that one last person is Christ. He gave up everything. He gave up everything. Our God doesn't make you do anything that you don't want to do. He asks you. He asks Christ, his son, will you? And Christ said, I will. And he left everything and emptied himself to become a human. Verse 7 reads, I'm going to read out of the English Standard, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. I'm going to jump down to verse 9. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So by his obedience, by Christ's obedience, he not only regained everything back 
and then some. But he also gathered us up and are taking us to heaven with him. But we need to believe and we need to obey. God has things in our lives that we need to do, some things that we struggle. It's a challenge for us. It is. It's heartbreaking. They are. They're mentally challenging. They are. But we need to do them because that's what God's will for us is. I'm going to read what Spurgeon wrote about this, this verse. And it, he states, we are, to give to the poor, we are to give to the poor out of pity, not to be seen and applauded, much less to get influence over them. But out of pure sympathy and compassion, we must give them help. We must not expect to get anything back from the poor, not even gratitude. But we should re- regard what we have done as a loan to the Lord. He undertakes the obligation, and if we look to him in the matter, we must not look to a second party. What an honor the Lord bestows upon us when he consents to borrow of us. That merchant is greatly favored who has the Lord on his books. It would seem pity to have such a name down for a sultry penance. Let us make it a heavy amount. The next needy man that comes this way, let us help him. As for repayment, we can hardly think of it, and yet here is the Lord's note of hand. Blessed be his name. His promise to pay is better than gold and silver. Are we running a little short through the depression of times? We may venture humbly to present this bill at the Bank of Faith. Thank you. Amen. That was a good message. Amen. Amen. I heard it last night, so I got to hear it twice. (laughs) But it is a good message. It's a good reminder that we all need. Like Bessie said, we're going into, you know, the holiday season, and we like to give and everything like that. But, you know, yeah. But uh, remember, it's not about just giving to the poor. It's even just helping those that are are in need that are running short because in the times that we're living so with that you know that's why we talk about our tithes and offering and giving to god because god will meet those needs for us so again like we have our box back there that we can give or you can give online at www.newhopefellowshipsandemus.org and give that way because as we give into the kingdom it goes back out to the to the world to help those that are in need like our missionaries that are out there in other countries but with that we're just going to close in a word of prayer so if you all stand with me dear lord we come before you lord and again we thank you and we praise you for the word that was given lord god lord we thank you that we could be those givers lord god to help those lord in need lord not looking so much for the reward lord but to help those lord because of the compassion and the love that you placed in us lord to help others and to show your love lord god towards them lord that they would know who you are in in their own lives lord lord and again we thank you for the opportunity that we had to come together lord just to see and to be with one another in unity lord and in your presence lord i pray for my brothers and sisters that have a blessed week this week lord god that you watch over them you provide for them lord we pray for those that weren't here today that you be with them wherever they may be lord god and even those that are struggling physically that you would touch them lord god with your divine healing hand right now lord god and that we would even have words to to um share with them lord about your love and goodness lord god lord and again we just ask that you continue to bless our time as we even go downstairs lord and again we just give you all the praise and all the glory and the whole church says amen remember you can go downstairs or